The dance of Eros is not really about sex, at least in the sense of physical sexual activity between bodies. Um, yeah, that may not be the way you have thought of Eros. In this episode, we are going to address bodies, but also the matters of the heart, the need for intimacy, the longings that we are created with, and what does that look like for those who are married and for those who are not married, but all of us who are following Jesus. A very lovely, beautiful, fascinating guest joins me on this episode. Bill Donahue is a lecturer and content specialist for Theology of the Body. He is the co-author of Rise, A Challenge for Men. He has been an educator in homeschool connections and adjunct faculty at the Immaculata University. Bill has been with the Theology of the Body for well over a decade, um, like about, I believe about 18 years, and has been widely talking to all kinds of different groups about how this understanding of how God made us works out in real life. I was privileged to hear Dr. Bill Donahue give a plenary lecture at the Sexual Integrity Leadership Summit held at Colorado Springs a few weeks ago. Um, we connected there and have been in communication back and forth, and I know that some of these ideas will both stretch, elevate, challenge, and I pray delight you. This is a conversation that gets to beauty and goodness. So here is Bill Donahue. I have been looking forward to this conversation. It was a privilege to get to meet you a few weeks ago. So first of all, just a huge thank you. My pleasure, Dr. Carroll. I, I... Same. It was great to meet you in Colorado, and I'm looking forward to a yeah. good chat. I think we have a great passion for the content uh, what we're about to share and talk about, so I'm, I'm thrilled. Me too. Well, um, maybe for starters, we're going to be talking about um, the body, sexuality, intimacy, and all of that. And one of the things that I have noted as I have talked with followers of Jesus in various contexts is that there are some, at least, that get the idea or have thought um, that, you know, the, the, the body is something to get rid of, um, that we're, mm. you know, looking for eternity when we get out of this body. And, and so, you know, the, mm. the spiritual, the immaterial, that's good, and this physical is bad. But that's not the way of Jesus. And I know at the theology of the body, you and others have really helped people understand a different perspective. I just want to start by giving you a minute to, to unpack that. Yeah, honestly, uh, it, it really is a trap, isn't it, to fall into this idea that yeah. the real me is somehow disconnected, not, not this body. This body is malleable, it's spare parts, it's, it's just luggage that carries my soul around in it. Mm -hmm. you know? when, the, when the reality is, you don't have a body, you are a body. We are embodied beings. God made us, you know, flesh and spirit, body and soul. We're this beautiful marriage, which the divine Ruah, God's breath, comes into and animates. So what a wild thing, Dr. Carol, that for, for millennia, we've had this tension between our own identity. Even today, especially today, perhaps, yes. we have this kind of fear of, of this body. We don't know what to do. But coming home to our senses, coming home to the reality that you are a body, it's a beautiful homecoming. It's an integration the way God originally planned it, right back in Eden when he created us in his image. Yeah. It occurs to me that the tomb is empty. Jesus didn't enter a disembodied spiritual essence of something at his resurrection. His mm. body was glorified, but it came too, and the whole paradigm uh, certainly yeah. of creation, but then of Jesus' incarnation and death and bodily resurrection says a lot mm. about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, really, in a way, it says everything. I mean, he, yeah. the incarnation is the centerpiece, the fact that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, if that doesn't ennoble the reality that the beauty of human nature, the human body, I don't know what will, that, and further even still, 
that he entered into the womb of Mary of Nazareth, that he took wow. on that vulnerability of being, I mean, let, let, let's use our language that we've, we've come to know through science, blastocyst, zygote, fetus, yes. you know, <laughs> yes. freshly newborn baby, so vulnerable that God would walk that walk and not see the body as somehow a distraction or a hindrance or, you know, worse than evil, but he came and said, this is my body given mm. up for you. Mm. I mean, that, that, that sets the tone, right? That's our lodestar is the word yes. become flesh. It's Christ. Yes. Well, those who have been uh, connected with me and listening to our show for a while know that we talk a lot <clears throat> about sexuality and intimacy and what that means as followers of Jesus and for our relationships so to move us in that direction, would you talk for a minute about what this understanding of being embodied beings says about the sexual part mm. of our nature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our very, our very composite of who we are, body and spirit, is our nature, yes. right? Human nature is our sexuality. You might say when God made us in his image and after his likeness, we could say that sexuality is the image of God. Wow, and you know, if we have a knee-jerk reaction and think, "Oh goodness, wait, my sex, my sexuality," this is the word of God in Genesis, right? Mm -hmm. That let mm -hmm. us make man in our image after our likeness, male and female. He created them. So, so we come into the presence of another person. We encounter the body. We encounter every person and creation itself in and through the body. So. Our senses, right? They're, they're the outliers. And all knowledge comes to us through the senses. It's sort of translated and taken up. You might say like the body becomes this bridge to the spirit. Mm. And this is the way the Lord designed it. So scripture is loaded with things like taste and see the goodness of the Lord, right? My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. My body pines for you, O Lord. My heart thirsts for you. We, we see this dance where it's it's flesh and spirit in a communion and in a marriage. And this is where the Lord meets us. So when we talk about intimacy, we can't have intimacy outside of the body. We, we, we can't be afraid somehow, right? The body, the face, particularly for human beings in a, in a yes. powerful way, the face is an invitation into intimacy. Yes. <laughs> you, can, you can read a person through the expressions of their body through a particular their face. I mean, you, you know, Dr. Cow, right? The eyes are the windows to the yes. soul, right? We say that all the time. So here, yes. here's holy ground, though. I will say that, especially in our very sexually broken age. Mm -hmm. I mean, since Genesis chapter three, we've been sexually broken, right? From the fall. Right, right. But right. I, I think when we talk about intimacy, it can certainly stir up in people a kind of fear because... You know, you look at another human being for more than 10 seconds in the eye and the whole well of your own stuff comes to the surface and there can be this fear. It's interesting. You can look in a dog's eyes for an hour, but if you look into a human being's eyes for 10 seconds, there, there's something that's changed, right? Yes. There's, a, there's a sudden spark because a human being is called to intimacy. It, we joke around at the Institute and we play with that word and say it means into me, see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the idea of being, as we were before the fall, naked without shame. Oh, uh, yes. I think, right, that like the deepest desire of the human being is to see and to be seen. Mm -hmm. I won't I won't say this is easy. And the work that you do, Dr. Carroll, right, we confess this is not easy, right. but it's a task worthy of man and woman. Mm -hmm. Because the deepest desire of my heart is intimacy, to see and to be seen to yeah. know and to be known. Uh, so, you know, I'll stop there for a moment because this opens up a whole lot of stuff. Mm. Uh, yes. it's, but it's an invitation in because I want to be loved and to love. And intimacy is the way into love. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you referenced Genesis 2.25, naked and without shame. It occurs to me, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but it occurs to me that the sense and, and what I do know a little bit about Hebrew is that the sense of that is not only 
were Adam and Eve without clothes on their bodies, but there were no coverings over their minds and hearts and, and, and yes. souls too. And we have forgotten that. I think in mm. our sexualized culture, we think that mm. you can get intimacy by taking the clothes off your body, but you are so beautifully talking about that does not equal intimacy. And it starts right there in Genesis 2. Oh, that's such a good point right there that, you know, in a way, this is the trick that or the trap, rather, that the easiest thing to do is become physically naked. And we yeah. see it happening yeah. in our sexually broken culture. And we think, well, now I've got what I'm, I'm looking for and hunger for. And then you realize that wasn't it. Yes. The deeper call is to an authentic spiritual nakedness or emotional nakedness, you could even say, where I am seen, I am known. Adam and Eve, as you referenced, right, our, our foreparents in the beginning, um, my favorite Polish theologian, philosopher, Karol Wojtyla, the future Pope John Paul II, yeah. he says, in the beginning, they could see and know each other with all the peace of the interior gaze. Mm. I've been haunted by those words of John Paul II, reflecting on Adam and Eve in the garden before the mm. fall. They could see and know each other with all the peace of the interior gaze. That means, to your point, it isn't just the flesh, right? But I, I, I penetrate through the mystery of this body yes. to the core, this person. And if I could set out a structure here that I think is really powerful, we move through attraction to, to others, right? And physical attraction is certainly important. It's one of them. It's kind of a, a stage. Uh, it's certainly the one that's involuntary. You know, you, you're struck by the beauty of another person and there, you do the double take like, wow, you know, here's flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones, you might say. But that experience of physical attraction should draw you because you're a human being into an emotional attraction. In other words, I want to know the interior world, like the exterior is attractive and I'm drawn, but yeah. I want to know the interior, the personality yes. of this person. And even those two physical and emotional attractions, we're not done yet. Mature love goes all the way to the core, mm -hmm. to the person. And again, when a person is authentically naked before another, uh, what does that mean? Honest, yes. true, uh, vulnerable, revealing their own wound, right? When you lock in on that person and fall in love, that's mature love. To the wow. point that even if the physical... Uh, should shift or change over time. Mm -hmm. um, I love you, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody says, I love you. I will go through all the seasons. I'm not going to change, be yes. a fair weather friend because the exterior has changed, but I've gotten to the core. And I think that's to the point of, right, naked without shame. Interestingly, that's a phrase in the Bible that is only said once in Genesis chapter two. You never hear it again, sadly, because we've fallen. But I think in the new heavens and the new earth, right? There'll be that return where we could finally gaze upon each other in freedom and really learn how to see. I'm, I'm longing mm. for that day to be seen and to see. Amen, amen. It reminds me of the last verse of 1 Corinthians 13. Then I will know even as I am known. Um, yes. You know, that the, the knowing and being known to, to the depths and, and there, there's many nuances of what Paul said there. But it speaks to, I mm -hmm. agree with you, the, the longing within us that we were made for that. And yeah. we're, we're, we can kind of segue in, into some of the challenges that that leaves us with. But we as human beings now mm. do not feel fully satisfied without that. And you, you mentioned that this is a picture of love. Well, God yeah. is love. And of course, he sees us that openly, but I have talked with many people, Bill, and I'm sure you have as well, where mm -hmm. um, for a, in many, many uh, possible reasons, people put up their own walls between them and God, pretending he can't yeah. see them. Um, mm -hmm. But th those mm -hmm. barriers uh, there keep us from the one who created intimacy and created us for intimacy in the first place. And I will... Just uh, re remind our, our listeners, that has nothing to do with sex and sexuality. Well, it has to do with sexuality. It has to do with the way we're made. But this is not sexual. Right. In the, in the, in the reductionistic sort of way that the people right. look at it today in our culture. Right. right. 
because right. this is who we are. Yes. Yeah, you're bringing up a, a really powerful point that takes us back again to Genesis. Isn't it interesting? We really need to tarry more in Genesis chapters one and two. So much is laid out that's foundational to our entire human story there. But Genesis three, right? One of the most tragic lines in scripture is when the Lord says to Adam and Eve, where are you? Yes. Right. Where are you? And to your point there, you can't hide from the divine gaze. What is the point there? But there's this sense of, of fear of, of a lockdown. And it's a distortion in, you know, this call to know God, like, yeah. He's not a tyrant. He's not a taskmaster. He he's not he's not just out to make rules to give us this stricture, but he yeah. builds a structure in which we're supposed to flourish. And you know, I, I love I love the line. I'll connect two things I think here from Old Testament to New, but in the Old Testament, when Adam and Eve finally did follow the first commandment of God, be fruitful and multiply, right? The language is so interesting. Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore a son. Now, this is so fascinating, right, Dr. Carroll? Because knowledge, biblically speaking, doesn't mean, you know, I've got some facts or I've done some intellectual work here, but Adam knew his wife Eve. She conceived and bore a son. That knowledge is so deep. It's it's spousal. It's marital. It's fruitful. And in Scripture, elsewhere, you shall know the Lord. Right. And that, again, that doesn't mean facts about God. Yeah. It means this spousal, intimate love. The prophets talk about, you know, the Lord's desire to espouse us to himself. Mm -hmm. When you read the prophet Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then the, the scriptures that speak of the bridegroom and the bride, the last book of the Bible in Revelation is this intimate knowledge of God that is defined as this wedding feast, this bridegroom and this bride meeting again. I think... Yeah, this is, again, a whole reset on what Christianity is. It is yes. not just knowing facts, commandments, following rules. It is this kind of spousal, intimate love that is fruitful. It's God's deepest desire, right? You're, you know, he, he's, he's our spouse. He's our husband. That is an amazing thing and a game changer, I think, for anybody who wants to live an authentic Christian life. Mm reframing the whole paradigm of christianity i think i think that's true um yeah. you pointed out in the um in the talk you gave in colorado springs that i was privileged to be a part of that right in the middle of the bible the mm. only book of the bible that is devoted to a single subject is devoted to this the song of songs yes. Yes. And it is unadulterated goodness. Some might think reading the whole of the Bible and knowing the sexualized, messed up culture that we are, are living mm -hmm. in, that God would have a lot of bad things to say about sex. But in the only book devoted to a single subject, it is unadulterated goodness. And it, it, frankly, it it's is. very erotic and very explicit. It is. It is. And, and it's wild when people stumble on it or hear reference yeah. to it because they think, well, yeah. what? Is that okay? Is that... Um like, yes, take a deep breath, everyone. It's in the Bible. The Holy yes. Spirit wanted it in the canon of scripture. It's in there. And it's it's pretty wild because when you go back and you look at some of the early church fathers or mystics throughout the centuries who've been pondering God's word, they love that book. Why? They see, they see the mystery of the one flesh union, the bridegroom and the bride, as an icon, as an image of what God desires for his people. Because, right? again, marriage was in Eden with Adam and Eve. It started the whole journey of the human race. Yep. Yep. Revelation at the end of the Bible has marital themes and spousal mysteries. The you know, Jerusalem is dressed as a bride bedecked to meet her husband. The spirit and the bride say, come. So the book ends her spousal right in the middle, as you say, the Song of Songs is the greatest spousal and deeply erotic in the best yes. sense of the word, love poetry. It really does, it does reframe everything. I, I'm not in this just to follow rules. I want relationship <laughs> and relationship is what sets me free. It's the romance of God's love for his people. Mm. And yeah, I don't know. Once you capture that, that's the truth of sacred scripture. You can't go back. It, you, and you say, what else could I possibly desire? But this infinite love that I've tasted a sparks foretastes of in my marriage or relationships, but now 
I'm I'm entering into the full blaze, right? This this kind of volcano okay. of love that is the divine for the human. Yeah. It's just beautiful. Yeah. It makes me think of, um, I, I think I'm going to get this right. What David said, my paraphrase, you know, I have you in heaven. What could I possibly desire more here on earth? I have you, yes. you are, you are my desire that that mm. deepest part of the longing of our souls that we were created for. Yeah. And what it, what that does, I think Dr. Carroll, it, what, when we get, it's sort of the seek first, the kingdom of God and all things come besides. Right. So yeah. suddenly when I realized he is the home of my heart. He is the bridegroom of my soul and body, Jesus himself. And that's what heaven will be, a wedding feast. It rightly calibrates all of my earthly relationships. I suddenly have a healthier approach to maybe marriage and family. I don't expect my spouse to be my Messiah or my Savior. I don't expect this particular relationship, right? Like to, Then I suddenly realize my idols have to be smashed. Wow. But I can also enjoy them for what they are mm -hmm. signs pointing to the kingdom so i can love my spouse rightly i can love good food and wine the pleasures of the world but i yes. don't obsess about them mm -hmm. i let them carry me towards god who is the fullness of all these things i've enjoyed they don't have a hold on me the one the way they once did in sin when i that, idolize them that is good causing us to smash our idols. Yeah, we could probably go for a long time on, on that one. But yeah. um, as you as you mentioned, the way that God woos his people as a as a husband, his his bride, would you speak mm. as a man to men? Um, because, you know, I, I'm a woman, so I don't always get to say things in ways that guys might hear quite the same. But mm -hmm. you are using that language as a man and as a... Uh, a minister and preacher of the gospel, speak mm -hmm. to what that means for men. Yes. The, the idea, the concept of being wooed by the divine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For our dear sisters, yourself included, and all my dear sisters, right? You you have physiologically uh, an affinity towards Christ. You can kind of get this, right? The revelation of God coming to you as the bridegroom, it sort of sits mm -hmm. easier you can plug into that sort of romance for men, for my brothers who are watching this episode, maybe uh, we are, you know, in a certain sense in the Ephesians five paradigm, right? We're sort of in the person of Christ in this relationship, but, but we also need to be open and wooed by him. What does that look like? We don't obviously sexualize the divine. This Correct. is an image that Correct. comes down. We're, yeah, we're not projecting it onto God, but he, he gives us images for me personally, I would say this, I, I, we all must be wooed by God. And for men, I think beauty is what does it. Beauty, mm -hmm. the beauty of, of the feminine, the beauty of the natural world, uh, great music, poetry, drama that cracks open our hearts. It makes men more vulnerable, right? Uh, you know, there's that, that, that false trip that, you know, real men don't cry. I think real men do cry. <laughs> Real men must cry. They must be pierced like St. Peter, who wept bitterly after he wounded the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the tears almost like they cleanse us. They refresh and open us. So men need to get back in touch with that mystery of receiving, mm -hmm. allowing beauty to destroy you, to move you, to shape your heart. And I think it doesn't threaten our masculinity at all. I find it actually opens and expands my masculinity because then i'm i'm so invested to become a guardian of beauty mm. a steward of beauty so in fact my masculinity becomes what it was supposed to be and i want to create this garden wall so that what i love my beautiful bride my children the church itself all that's true good and beautiful beautiful can thrive flourish right so so it's my heart being moved first and i I think by creating a culture of beauty for a man, um, that is just such a way to become a healthy, truly masculine man. And, you know, we hear toxic masculinity fly around a lot in the culture today. When you let beauty move you, mm -hmm. brothers, I'll speak to you directly, that's the tonic of your masculinity, right? Toxic mm -hmm. masculinity, yes, it's bad. But the tonic of your masculinity, right. that means that you're you're this exhilarating 
elixir that the world needs, right? We need your virility, but yes. it has to be moved and shaped by the beauty that surrounds you. Don't mm -hmm. become stoic and hard, right? Open yeah. to beauty. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Uh, that I, I, I love that perspective. Um, I think some in certain branches of the body of Christ have given some men the idea that if you want to be a good Christian, well, you're not really a man. Well, it's just the opposite. And I thank mm. you for I, I thank you for uh, describing that, getting Absolutely. into the, the heart of what makes a man truly alive and the mm. tonic. Yeah, I love that language. Can um, I speak another word into that, Dr. Crow, real quick? I, yeah. I've been so struck and formed myself when, you know, we open up the Hebrew, you dive into the scriptures and their original languages. But, you know, the first man had a mandate and, and it's beautiful because the Greek word, uh, the, the Hebrew words, shamar and aboda, they mean that the first man and all men and women really, but the first man, Adam, was called to shamar, guard, protect, and aboda means to cultivate or care for. That's that's real masculinity, right? And, and what are we doing? Treasuring what is beautiful, yes. forming a house around what is beautiful so that it can thrive. So to guard and protect, to care for and to cultivate, that's both strength and gentleness, tenderness in the cultivation of things. That's authentic masculinity. Mm. Yeah, Beautiful, beautiful. Well, um, Genesis 3 happens. And now, thousands of years later, we where we we're where we are, but the gospel has not lost its power. Um, mm. And I want to talk for a minute to two groups of people who may be hearing this and say, um, "Yeah, that that's beautiful, but what about where I live?" Let's talk to married people, and then we'll talk to unmarried people. For the mm. married people, um, you've used uh, some very appropriate and beautiful allusions to this desire for intimacy that God built within us and how marriage is to be the de demonstration of that on earth. But would you just talk for a few minutes about how that works out in, um, I'm waking up every morning next to the person that, you know, it's not always so smooth. What does this <sighs> intimacy mean in the marriage bed with sexuality between husband yeah. and wife? Unpack that for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Such a great question. A good pastoral question, Dr. Carroll. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming on 21 years married to my beloved bride, Rebecca. 21 years, I can't believe it. She hasn't aged a day. I, I certainly have aged a little bit. But I think, I think marital spirituality, the key tenet of marital spirituality, this great dance of man and woman in yeah. such an intimate way, is tenderness. Mm. Tenderness mm. to the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual well-being of your spouse. Yeah. Right. So it's never this sort of, you know, iron fist or sort of domination. It's a kind of real tender dominion. Right. So there's there's this structure, there's this place, this home, this house. And inside is tenderness. That means um, a kind of mutual gift of self. It's a it's a putting you before me. How can I serve you today? Yes. Uh, when I ask you how you're doing, I stay for the answer. Right. I, I wait when a husband comes home from work. And boy, I learned this early on. Right. Men sometimes can be short on words. Dr. Carroll, I don't know if you've noticed this. Like Rebecca would say, how's your day? Good. Right. <laughs> then I say, Rebecca, how was your day? And I need to sit down for 25 minutes because she's going to give me every juicy detail of, you know. But here is where men, husbands can practice that tenderness of being really attentive. Yeah. Sit down. What's more important right now? than actually being present and attentive to your spouse, to your beloved. Mm -hmm. When you practice the spirituality of tenderness, which means attentiveness, right? And, and a, a single-hearted focus, you start realizing there's a physiological benefits. Your own heart rate slows down. You start to become more open, your senses. You start to pick up on details. You start to pick up on passions and proclivities of your bride, your beloved. You start to realize like how important these things are. You know, you actually remember what her favorite candy is, you know, her favorite color. You remember things. And and I think this this kind of tenderness, it starts to forge, you know, there's like these tendrils that come out and just this beautiful bond. Mm -hmm. Because as we talked about before, right, I, I'm not just rooting my love in sensuality or physical yeah. attraction. 
I'm also not just rooting it in like the emotional give back I get from you. You make me feel good. Right. I've hit mature love. I, it's not about what you do for me. What can I do for you? Mm -hmm. When you hit that selfless donative, self donative love. And I think tenderness is what really gets you to that place. So it's, it's the, it's, it's the attention. In the words of my, again, my favorite spiritual author, Pope John Paul II, he says, we should get to a point where we sense even the deepest tremors of the soul mm. of the beloved. Mm. So it's, it's like the seismograph, you know, you're, uh, you're yeah. understanding like, okay, this is, this just struck her. This hit her in a way. It didn't hit me that way, but it's hitting her. How can I serve? Yeah. How can I serve this fairest of love that is my bride? Mm. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a work in progress. I'm working on that too, but man, it just yeah. makes everything richer. And finally, this kind of love and marital spirituality and tenderness will radiate out. The kids will feel it. Mm -hmm. The yes. kids will have a sense of, wow, this is how a person should treat another person. And there, then stability comes in. And then when they grow and mature, they're going to say, I want what mom and dad have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How can I find somebody that has that kind of tenderness and love and attention? That's what I want. Mm. So. It's a, that's a beautiful picture. And I think it applies to both men and women. I would say to you know my, my fellow sisters that if you approach marriage and your husband as, okay, now he's got to do everything for me, it's no healthier on that side, criticizing mm. I've got to make him who I want him to be. That, that mm. That's no healthier to do that yeah. than it is for a, a, a man to do that. This, this tenderness applies to both. It's also a different paradigm of marriage then some would say, um, even if someone is subscribing to and following the biblical Christian sexual ethic of sex is for marriage, okay, it's like once I have a wedding ring, then I can do it. And you're there to please mm. me. You're there for my physical gratification. Um, yeah. Sex is important between husband and wife. God created it as good. But when it becomes about my pleasure, um, there's yeah. a lot of destruction that can come. And, and you've given a foundation that, mm. no, it, 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 it's not. Even the physical acts of sex need to come out of this mutual tenderness. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Because in this relationship, we're dealing with persons. Not yes. not parts not parts of a machine that give pleasure yes. to you. This is not a mechanistic way of looking. Yes. The culture has formed us this way. The culture has formed this kind of sexual utilitarianism, mm -hmm. right? Like, what are you going to give me? Yep. We're not in the realm of parts of a machine, but a person. And you know, when you get that, you get you get it all. That's what it's about. That's good. And it's got to be it's it's got to be one hundred percent. Yeah, and it certainly isn't. Also, um, I did this, so you owe me that. Right. This is not a contract, right? You, you didn't abide by the contractual agreement that we made. Yep. This is a covenant, mm -hmm. which means sacred bond between persons, not a contract. It's not an exchange of goods. Yes. It's a, it's a covenant in God. So it's a whole yes. different. Thing. Yes. Yes. Um, now to those who are unmarried. I lived unmarried until God brought my husband into my life in my 40s. That was a lot of years. I am living unmarried again since my husband passed away and went to be with the Lord. Um, mm. From my Christian tradition in the Protestant world, there is often uh, single people who say to me, there isn't a place for me in the church. Um, and in your Catholic tradition, I think there's something that... Um, those of us in the Protestant tradition sometimes miss that the, mm -hmm. the Catholic tradition right from the day Jesus returned to heaven, the single life was valued as important. And I think Paul did in first Corinthians seven, he basically says both are, both are important. Marriage is important, but singleness, would you just take this theology of the body paradigm? And what does this yeah. say? to unmarried persons, whether unmarried for a season or their life, their vocation, yeah. um, how does the need for mm -hmm. intimacy they experience play out with what we've been talking about here? Yeah, yeah, such an important question, because as you said, Dr. Carroll, there's a lot of people who find themselves either voluntarily or involuntarily yes. many times in that, that position. Yes. So we kind of mentioned this a little earlier, but 
in the design of God for our sexuality, you know, this is the, this is the realm of time and space. This is a, a fallen world, but it's a preparation for the fullness of heaven, which we already talked about as the wedding feast of the Lamb, where all the signs give way to the reality. Mm-hmm. So marriage is the, I mean, it's it's the watermark behind all of creation is marriage. Yeah. And this is why Jesus revealed himself as the bridegroom. So, you know, your experience of marriage for those years you have with your husband and praise God, and we praise with the Lord yes. now, my experience with Rebecca now, yes. for as long as, you know, till death do us part, yes. is a school of love and a preparation in this world. Mm-hmm. But the sign will give way to a reality. So marriage now is is preparatory in a powerful way, right? It's preparing me. It's not my ultimate end. So if someone finds themselves, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, in a single state, they have to realize like, okay, well, this is my time then to be purified of any idols. I can't start thinking if I could only find someone, then I could start living. Then right. I'll be truly happy. Right. Right. Well, it sounds like that's starting to slide into an idolatry of the sign. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mm -hmm. this is a time to be purified, to be um, recalibrated, reoriented, to understand that it is Christ who fills me. Mm -hmm. Now, when, again, seek first the kingdom and all things may come besides, once we understand that ultimate relationship and that's established and fills us, right? And we're not looking, there's no lack. The yes. Lord, who knows, the Lord may suddenly open a door and like, oh, sure. wow, here's a partner, Absolutely. right? Yes. This is important. Adam and Eve, you know, that original Hebrew, when uh, the God, God said, I want to make a suitable partner, right? It's ezer, E-Z-E-R. It means helpmate. Yes. It doesn't mean savior or Messiah. Right. Yes. So so marriage is now the ezer, the helpmate. To, to tell me what? Help me prepare my heart for the beloved, the divine beloved. So it's a time of preparation. It's a time of purification. No doubt, it can certainly burn. It can hurt. There's there's many, and we have friends as well. So if I could only find someone, it's like, okay, but there still is someone, capital S someone, who's preparing your heart now and will ultimately fulfill you. Yes, that's good. That's really good. Um, in referencing um, the Lord as our husband, that you you referenced that scripture earlier, mm. that has become even more precious to me since my husband passed away. And it's not that oh, I didn't man, know man. God that way before, mm. but it has become so much deeper now. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, I'm thinking of uh, the prophetess Anna, who yes. was always in the temple. Yeah. Always in the temple because she's with her beloved, right? And yes. then the gift that God would bring the infant Christ and she would be able to see the word made flesh, you know, that's like a completion for her. Yeah. So that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Dr. Yeah. I also know that there are single people who may be listening to us that feel, yeah, that's right, but I need God with skin on. Um, Jesus <laughs> pursued intimacy with a few and for those of us who are not married this isn't a biological physical sexual thing but the need for intimacy is not dependent on relationship status and i when i came to understand how jesus in one sense truly needed a few other humans it helped Mm -hmm. me understand the difference between biological physical physical sexual activity and the need for intimacy that all of us are invited to seek. Yes, yes, yes. That's a great, another great point. We must, we, a human being is a being in relation, in relatio. Yes. We are made for an other. Yes. And that that doesn't, yeah, don't just think this means I must get married. Everybody should be married. You have to have sexual intimacy. No, intimacy is wider, deeper, broader yes. than all that. And I love, Dr. Kara, how you brought Jesus into that. He had... He had, you know, so many that loved him and knew him and followed him, but he had the 12. And within the 12, he had the three, Peter, James, and John. And, you know, the beloved uh, apostle who leaned his head on his breast on the night of Holy Thursday, right? It was so beautiful and so intimate. We all have to have that. We we long for it. I'm going back to my, you know, as a Catholic, my, my spiritual mentor, John Paul II. Now, he was a celibate Catholic priest. Yep. Yep. This whole reflection that's formed my life and helped me 
is flowing from the heart of a celibate priest. Now, well, how do we know about intimacy and relationships? Because he was a man, he was a human being, yeah. and it didn't have to be sexual. When he was a young priest, he used to go on, on hiking trips and expeditions with young people. There would be like a dozen or so. They would go on kayaking trips and mountain climbing and hiking and they used to talk about life and vocation and family and discernment and prayer and bonds were formed. He, he used the Polish word slodowisko. Slodowisko means like a culture or environment. Mm -hmm. And he recognized like everybody, single, married, celibate, whatever you are, yes. we thirst for face-to-face -face communication of ideas, emotions, hearts, experiences, yes. and all of his knowledge flowed from those beautiful relationships, some of which went on for 50 years, followed him to his work in, in Rome as the, as the pontiff. So yeah, we, we all need to encounter God with skin on, right? Mm. <laughs> to use your mm. phrase. Mm. We, we, we are made for relationship and we don't, we have to be careful. Our culture wants to hypersexualize yes. everything. And so all this yes. must be sexual. Okay. In the sense that we are all sexual beings, but it doesn't mean the activity. You know, sex is first the noun before sex is a verb. That's good. Right? That's I think good. we obsess and think it's just the verb. But yeah, th this is where we encounter the Lord in and through the body. That's mm. how he comes to us. That's good. That's really good. Um, final point I'd like us to talk about for a second. And that's the whole idea of eros and desire. We've alluded to it and we've, we've used different words mm. around this. You talked a little bit about this in our uh, in in the the talk you gave in Colorado, but um, how eros, how the deepest desires of us point us to God and point us to eternity, the part of us that truly is made to desire and long. Um, yes. I I think one of the things evil has done is sexualize eros. It doesn't mean that it's not sexual, but we miss the ultimate desire mm. eros yes yes it's such a thanks for bringing that up it's such a, a word that needs rehabilitation today yes. because as you said people hear eros e-r-o-s the greek word for a kind of passion or attraction and they slide into erotic and that takes some thoughts of like well what is that pornography you know rated r movies nudity yes. It's like, well, no, the, the evil one loves to hijack God's very good words and twist them and make them his own. So, you know, Eros has been defined, and this even goes back to the ancient Greeks, but it's like an inner power or passion that attracts us to what's true, good, and beautiful. Mm. Now, truth, goodness, and beauty are these transcendent qualities of God, really, that come into the world and we encounter truth, beauty, goodness, in all the things of the material world. Eros is our draw into that, our attraction, as you said, our longing, which is a great word. Who, who hasn't experienced the pangs of longing, right? And that, that can come through good music, uh, relationships, love, uh, poetry, the smell of a bonfire. I mean, there's so many things that stir longing, take us to memories of home. Yeah. or stir desire for our ultimate home. Yes. Eros is constitutive of an authentic Christian life. Don't mm -hmm. try to run away from Eros. The authentic Christian isn't somebody who just throws a wet blanket over that, and I'm just going to become spiritual. <laughs> Remember, you, you can't get to the supernatural by bypassing the natural. Thank you. God gave us the body, right? God calls to us through the body. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. So if we follow arrows, this longing for the infinite, infinite truth, infinite beauty, infinite goodness, we will follow. It's almost like salmon rushing upstream. You know, those nature shows, Dr. Carey, see the salmon leaping up yep. the torrent, yep. right? Yep. The torrent is, is all the beautiful and true and good things we encounter in the world, but we don't cling to them. We, we rise, we go for the capital. E arrows. We go all the way up till we encounter agape, God's divine love coming down, mm. and that's that's an authentic Christian life. It's a life of, uh, I mean, Jesus Himself said, "I long to kindle a fire upon the earth." Yes. Right? That sounds like an arrows to me. That doesn't sound like wet blanket, boring Jesus. It doesn't sound boring at all. I, there's a philosopher, Peter Crave, who says. If your Jesus is boring, you have the wrong Jesus. Yep, yep. 
I mean, he, he wants to spread a fire upon the earth. It's just that we have to be careful of not settling for less, mm. so to speak, right? Lust, Eros that becomes obsessed with a lustful approach falls so short of authentic love. Lust mm. is a pale whimpering thing compared to the raging fire of what love, authentic love is. And Eros takes us all the way up there. Mm. That's good. Um Bill, you have been working now with theology of the body for what, over 10 years? Um, and I'm sure yeah, well, that there yeah. are some who are listening or watching who feel like you have painted a picture that is beautiful and glorious, but I'm nowhere near there. Um, can you maybe just mention um, how, you know, TOB or, or your work or just what might somebody do that feels like, that's such a big mountain. How do I ever move there? Um, mm. give, give a little hope maybe to a person who th yeah, that, that yeah, seems yeah. a little otherworldly. Sure. Yeah. Because we certainly don't want it to be otherworldly or seem too spiritual that it's detached from the body itself. But yeah, it's, it's all in and through it. My, I guess it's probably been 18 years now that I've been with the Institute. 18 okay. years now. Okay. And my my first touch with this teaching, however, was I was 16 years old. It was mm. 1986 mm. when I first encountered it. And I'll say this, I, you know, I'm still learning and growing. This, this is the good news that comes to us. That's what this whole teaching, the theology of the body is. It's another word for Jesus. He is the theology in the body. Mm. <laughs> but what it did for me, and it's been, it's, it's like this slow cooking thought here. Yeah. When I was a teenager, you know, teenagers have a vision of God, and sometimes it's sort of the old man way up in the clouds or just, you know, the lawgiver, the rule maker. Yep. Uh, what this teaching did for me is it shifted that image of God to not so much lawgiver as lover, mm. right? Okay. And, and not so much like he's just spitting rules at me, but he wants relationship at a okay. very deep level. And I started realizing he's coming at me from so many ways. Mm. He comes to me through the word of God, but he comes at me also through all the things that move me. Yes. And so the, the journey is like, don't discount anything. The Lord can work through anything and That's will good. to attract and draw your heart. So I would say, be patient. If you're thinking, whoa, I don't even you know. God is the bridegroom. Jesus is the lover of my soul. I don't even know. I can't even follow the 10 commandments right, right now. Go slowly. Just know this truth. You are his beloved. Mm. You are his beloved. I, let me lay it out this way, Dr. Carl. I'll try to do this briefly, but because this is a, a paradigm I try to work through myself. We are all sons and daughters first. Right. Sons and daughters who are his beloved. Mm. And we grow and mature in that safety of knowing we are his beloved into brothers and sisters. When we realize we're brothers and sisters, we look around at other people, not as like occasions of sin or yeah. But as occasions of grace, right? This this other person who is not me is an invitation. So brothers and sisters means relationships, manifold relationships. Then as we grow in this theology of our bodies, right? We move to the next level of spouse. Mm. And I've, I've entered relationships with brothers and sisters who are not me. Now I want to give back in spousal love, perhaps. And so that gift of self generates another level of motherhood, fatherhood. And in all of these manifold relationships, my heart's being broken and expanding and becoming bigger. And I'm letting the whole world come. I'm starting to fill my, Pope Francis says, fill your heart with faces and names, mm -hmm. right? Fill your heart with faces and names. And so I'm learning that this theology of my body is, is I'm getting a heart like unto God himself. It's like King David, right? He had a heart like unto God himself. And so through it all, you know, you're, you're, you stumble, you fall. Sometimes you might misuse people or yourself, but let it, let his fire of love burn away the dross, burn away the dross. Lord, I want to see, mm. Lord, I want to see blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God yeah. where up in the clouds. No, everywhere. I'll see him in my neighbor. I'll see him in the, the opposite sex. I'll see him everywhere. And I'll be purified as I move through these stages of son, brother, spouse, father, right? Daughter, sister, uh, spouse, mother. And I arrive, you know, I arrive at the fullness of what it means to be human. It's never an escape from our bodies. It's, a, it's, a, it's the homecoming. 
Mm. I love that picture. Uh, Bill, I, I know there's probably a lot more we could say, but I just want to thank yeah. you so much um, for your work and, and for this conversation. I find my heart um, elevated. I find my longing, my eros yes, uh, just yes. uh, lifted up as we talk about <laughs> these things for the way God built us and what he has designed us for, both for here and for eternity, both. Yes, thank amen. You. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Carroll. What a privilege. It's a joy for me as well. Oh, my. I pray your heart soared as well with longing in your own being, with perhaps some grace for your body, some understanding of the goodness of who God is and what he is inviting all of us into, both for our lives here now in this place today and even more for eternity. Check the links under this video. We'll have the link to Theology of the Body Institute and also to the RISE 30-Day Challenge for Men that Bill Donahue was a co-author of. You may find that useful. I also want to mention my book, Sexpectations, Reframing Your Good and Not-So-Good Stories about God, love, and relationships. I talk a lot about intimacy in this book, like Bill and I talked about in this conversation. Differentiating that from the acts that you do with your body, but the acts that you do with your body matter, and how does all that play out, and how do you deal with your sexual story? The good and perhaps very much not so good things that you experienced, perhaps you have done, and what does it look like to bring Jesus into that story? That's what the book is about. I would also love to hear from you. Leave a comment under this video. I read every one, and when I can be helpful, I respond. You can also get in touch with me confidentially using the contact page at drcarolministries.com, and I would love to hear from you there as well. Make sure you're subscribed to our channel so you can get the material we put up here usually every week. Tell a friend about this conversation or any of our videos. Spread the word. And until next time, may God bless you.